All right, and we are ready to get started with today's webinar on what is the Office of Community Services Community Economic Development Grant Program, or can I use 800,000 to create jobs for my community? It's part of a CED webinar series that we have been doing throughout the spring and summer here at Community Action Partnership. This is the third installment. Hope you uh, were able to join us for the previous ones and are going to be registering for our fourth one in July. We do have a new face at Community Action Partnership that is heading up a lot of our community economic development work along with our Community Action Financial Institute, Kathy. So I do want to introduce him to uh, let him become familiar to you. So with that, uh, Kevin, if you'll take away. Hello, everybody. This is Kevin Kelly, new Director for Community Economic Development here at the Partnership. I so welcome everybody to the call, and I look forward to seeing some of you, if not all of you, at the August conference in Austin. And I'm here to uh, promote community economic development, and also we have some loan capital, which I'll talk about more in the, the July webinar. But for now, I'll, I'll turn it over to our, our session leaders for today. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Glenn Sonata from the California Community Economic Development Association, who has been uh, super helpful on getting um, this webinar series together as well as our annual convention. So Glenn, uh, tell us what we're going to be doing today. All right. Um, well, let's see. We've got a. Um, we've we're going to the introductions right now. Um, Julie Jacopic is going to be talking about the program itself. She's with ICF International, and they've been doing a lot of work being subcontracted by HHS, the OCS unit, and um, knows a lot about the program. Um, I will follow up with some case studies. We provide a lot of technical assistance and had a chance to work with a lot of groups throughout the country, and I'll try to give you a broad example of how um, some of these dollars have been used in the past, and then we'll have questions and answers at the end. So we had um, Julie on. Thanks. Good afternoon. Actually, I kind of forgot about this when we were planning, Glenn, but the CA for CAFI is actually a CED grant. That as we move through these. Uh, the Community Economic Development Program is part of the same legislation as the CSBG program and uh, is housed in OCS in the Division of Community Discretionary Programs. And its purpose, the creation of jobs for low-income folks. So it supports business development that is designed to create those jobs that uh, help low-income families and uh, increase their self-sufficiency and help low-income communities uh, be place that people want to be. The best behind this is that jobs lead to increased self sufficiency. The creation of business and jobs and low income communities helps improve lives. The, the community development corporations, and we'll talk a little bit about what that they are, but many community action agencies are community development corporations. Um, know your community and that you can create. Uh, prosperous jobs in the community, and that the federal grant dollars attract additional investments, and we'll talk a little bit about why that might be as well. It's grants for the startup or expansion of a business, for capital expenditure, so it might be buying a building, for example, expenses for the start of a business, harder soft costs of a commercial development. And the investments are loans, and that would relate, for example, to the CAFI project. Earlier, many community action agencies are, in fact, community development corporations. Community development corporations is a term, but it is not a formal designation. And it refers to organizations that have as their primary purpose the plan developing, managing of low income housing or community economic development. Are one C three organizations and governed by a tripartite board of directors. Community action agencies have uh, tri tripartite boards of directors, and so in many cases, uh, community action agencies also serve as community development. Um, 
uh, Congress appropriates somewhere between 20 and $30 million in funds. Uh, this year's appropriation number is not yet known. Um, and these of projects that uh, the PREMP funds are for business incubators, the building of a shopping center, manufacturing, actual initiatives, which relates to the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Locally determined, again, part of the community services, the same legislation as the community services block grant. The goal is to create sustainable, full-time, full-year, and 75% of those jobs must be filled by individuals with incomes at or below 125% of poverty. Projects, construction, non-construction. So the example of buying a building is a clearly a construction project where you're actually investing in real estate. Uh, or changing the nature of a piece of real estate. Construction projects could be any could be projects that may have a real estate component, but the CE funds are not being used for it, or involve the expansion of a business in a site that is already controlled, where the business already is. So it might be adding additional positions to an existing business, for example. Examples of the kinds of projects that the CED program funds: retail development. Business incubators, technology, child care centers, food services, green jobs. A number of uh, CED projects also uh, going to organizations that serve as community development finance institutions, which is what CAFI is. And I know that Kevin will talk about that in the July webinar. But there also are essentially loan programs that are established with the CED fund. Uh, as part of the First Lady's Let's Move initiative and really thinking about how to improve health, one of the challenges we know in low-income communities is access to healthy food. If the only store you can walk to is 7-Eleven, you're likely to have a lot more potato chips and a lot less apples. So the uh, Department of Health and Human Services worked with the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Treasury to create the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. About a third of the CED money has gone in the last several years to this program. And what happens in this program is that uh, each agency has its own set of offerings. It's not, in a, it's not a formal federal program with legislation. But there are loan programs, both at the Department of Agriculture and at the Department of Treasury in particular. There's a category of CDFI projects that are related specifically to economic development leading to uh, the of healthy food opportunities in low-income communities. Uh, and a portion of the CED program has been set aside to do the same. Um, and in C, there's two fo focuses. One is to improve access to healthy food and continue to create jobs for low-income individuals. Some of the kinds of projects that have been funded as economic community economic development projects in the community economic development program have been assisting grocery stores. That's kind of an obvious one. But it's all been uh, assistance to farmers, uh, creating urban farms, uh, re urban retail markets, which may be supporting a market business, but it also could be a farmer's uh, distribution. So we have a number of projects that are looking at um, to take food from a farm through its whole life course. So it may be from farm to farmer's market to to sauce that I'm selling from there. Um, and the revolving loan funds for food business entre entrepreneurs. And many of the CED projects are, in fact, revolving loan funds to uh, businesses that are creating jobs for low-income folks um, and doing so in the community. So, a bar so the product itself, Will to create a to lend money as money is paid back, it's lent again for the same purposes in that community. Tricks for the program are again jobs created. I'm starting at the bottom, but jobs created, and these need to be new jobs, not not new in an existing job, but a new job that is a permanent and full time, full year position. 
created or expanded, again, in order to create those jobs, and funds leveraged. And I want to talk a little bit about leveraged for a second. You'll remember minutes ago I talked about the grant being an opportunity to additional investment. The reason that banks or other financial institutions often don't invest in low-income communities or in new businesses, particularly those that are designed to employ low-income individuals, a certain amount of risk with the success or failure of any new business, and they perceive the risk of a business in a low-income community as being higher. And what a grant does is allow for lowering that risk because so that they're not on the hook for all the money that's needed, that A, the government invested in this organization, and B, that money is guaranteed to be in the project. Um, most grants are in the neighborhood of about $800,000. With that, there's an expectation of how many jobs will be created, and depending on whether or not it's a construction project, the expectations are that every $20,000 or $25,000 received through a grant, a job will be created. And so hopefully that helps explain a little bit about why these grants can actually spur investment. And I think it's also important to note that unlike most of the other that invest in community economic development, this is a grant, it is not a loan. So it is an actual grant. Subdivisions. These are not simple projects, and oftentimes the lead time to set up to be ready to apply is long before the RFP is uh, or the funding opportunity announcement is announced. Uh, you go to the link on the first slide of this which is basically the OCS website, and look for economic development, you'll see what has been a largely standing announcement. So the major, for the most part, next year's announcement will look like last year's, for all, which looks a lot like the year before. And it's important that you follow instructions and answer all the questions consistently. You've never heard me talk about reading a, a an opportunity announcement. Let me be really clear, the most important section, even though you're really smart and you know what words mean, is actually the definitions because it's the place where ACF can explain more fully what they want within the rules of an application process that looks the same depending in and of which program is being uh, funded. Um, it must include a clear, complete, and compelling business plan that demonstrates potential profitability. Business has to hold water. It has to, going, you have to show how you're actually going to be profitable after the end of the grant. The program requires that jobs be uh, ready to go a year before the end of the grant, and the idea is to be that you're creating permanent full-time jobs. So you want these jobs to continue being the life cycle of the grant, and ask for demonstrations of prior success. If you were to all of the points, you would want to either demonstrate prior success or partner with an organization that can, in fact, demonstrate that it has been successful in creating jobs. that these will be reviewed both for programmatic and finance perspectives. So having a great idea that will never make money but serve people well will not get funded. It really has to meet both tests. Um, it needs to be ready to go on the day of the grant award. And I know that's complicated, right? Because you may have some contingent funding, you may have some other contingencies, but it needs to be ready to go. These are not planning grants. Um, they are grants for implementation. And part of that, and I think often the biggest challenge, is if you're starting a new project, if you are building something new, you've got to demonstrate that you have control of the site. And I'll give an example. If you want to build a, a grocery store in a new in a community, a new grocery store in a community, if you don't have the space that your grocery store in when the grant starts, you're not likely to finish the project before the end. So the idea is that you've got to have identified the space and at least have, if not a sign lease, a condition lease, that you would have the property. Again, I know other proposals, but you are demonstrating that you have partnerships. You want to document those partnerships. You want to document the roles and responsibilities in those partnerships. So not will with a C company, but our role is going to be X and ABC company's role is going to be Y. Um, if we're going to do loans, it needs to be clear what the terms of loans are going to be. Who are you? At what kind of rates? 
how so the most these projects really do get their loans repaid, but how are you actually going to ensure repayment? What are the penalties for non-payment? Um, you demonstrating that you will be a good steward of federal dollars. And most nations demonstrate that they can attract additional public and private investment to increase the capacity of these projects. Um, we are revitalizing a community that a, a community space that has been um, in this in trouble. Um, you're going to want to demonstrate that you're going to be able to actually improve the space because wait, this is really a project that not just kind of only creates the jobs for the people who work in these projects, but also is designed and created for the purpose of helping people realize their community. So Glenn, and you should jump in here too. Any questions about the program, Glenn, actual examples? Any questions? seen any, but I do want to remind everybody that uh, there's actually two different methodologies for getting uh, your questions in. Uh, you can put them in through the Q&A box, and we do ask that you select all panelists to send your question to. Uh, you can also find us in the chat window um, as well to ask questions, and uh, don't be shy. You can ask them at any point uh, during the webinar, and we will uh, scroll through and make sure that we can cover as many as we can. And anticipating a couple, this is a program that is usually announced in the spring, usually with 45, 60, 40 days at minimum, usually hopefully 60 days to respond, um, is almost always announced at the very end of the federal fiscal year. So the uh, actually reviews were just completed in the last few weeks. Um, and so this project won't reappear until March or April, assuming uh, uh, that in the application are how are that business plan piece are demonstrating that you've got site control, and how your loans are going to work. If that, that's a piece of what you're going to do, um, really ready to go. And I encourage you to read it now and start preparing for next year so that you can build those relationships, look for property, all of the things that would go into that. Um, and go on to well, Glenn is going to give you some examples in a little bit of community action agencies work. You can also go to the OCS website and see uh, descriptions of, of products over the last several years, both in terms of healthy food finance and the regular uh, economic development program. Also, a resource component. It's also worth asking questions early. These are somewhat complicated, and. Uh, but they are one of the few places you can get uh, money to, for a, a startup. So um, I think that's a major opportunity for community action. Um, because they're complicated, these are not, um, there are programs one might apply for where, where you've got a one in 10 chance of winning. That would not be the case with this program. So it is, it is an achievable program. Uh, thing to look out for next year will probably be, and you never heard me say this, but some interest in looking at the quality of jobs as well as the fact that they're created. Um, I'm trying to think of the questions people might ask. I'm seeing them. Why don't you maybe, as you talk and spark people's imaginations, um, that's some more questions for one or both of us. Or, um, one of the um, um, things that Julie touched on that's really important is the is in your project ready when the application period comes around because the CDA window is very short to, and almost impossible to put a project together. You almost at this point need to have whatever project is almost a full blown business plan prior to that announcement date so that your time is spent just transferring the information into the format of the application. It, it, it is a pretty complex um, application process, I mean, or period of time and questions that you've got to answer. But a lot of them, you know, would have been done through a business plan where you know who your partners are, where you've already tied up 
relationships re related to the property, related to who partners are, what they're going to do, um, and also getting the letters of support. So it's really important to, to really be ahead of the um, time period when that announcement comes out. Um, Julie, can you touch a little bit about the um, uh, process, you know, who, who looks at these things and, you know, their scoring and, and how that all works? Sure. Me? Uh, yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if it had to be passed back or not. Absolutely. So these are reviewed by panels that are, so actually, and I would actually say one of the best ways to learn this program is actually to be aware. Um, panels who know the government side of community economic development, have small business expertise, or actually have the financial expertise. Expertise. In a perfect world, everybody on a panel would have all of those things. We try to ensure that each panel has at least one person with finance expertise. Uh, they are, so it's a, a panel of outside experts who score them. Most years they're bonus points, so they'll be ranked by score, both looking with and without bonus points. And the highest point earners are who get funds, unless there's some strength going on. Um, and for example, if somebody has a project that's in trouble, they might not get the next project. But for the most part, they are funded in numerical order. The majority of the points are associated with that business plan. Um, and that business plan becomes the most important piece of what you um, it's a fairly competitive process. People are encouraged to use the full range of points so that there really is a spread. And one of the things that OCS has worked quite hard on in the last several years is creating a way to spread out scores so that can see the differences between projects. So it's a really rigorous review. Um, it's also fairly explicit in the actual RFP what, uh, or funding opportunity announcement what, what will and what will uh, earn the points to win, to, to win, basically. Linda, did you were thinking about? Yeah, no, I think I think it's important to know, um, you know, basically uh, which detail you really need because it is being reviewed by uh, peers who have um, involved in economic development um, for a while. So it, it's really important to to have your information really go through it um, up front. Um, and this is still um, the program is appropriate annually, so no one really knows how much is going to be available year to year. Is that true? Yeah, no, right. Um, so if I, I the amount has been fairly stable, there's no guarantee of that. Just we do not have next year's appropriation. The money that will be awarded in September will be this year's money. But it has been fairly consistent in, in and around 26 to $30 million. dollars way to get on um, the announcement waiting list, or, or does someone announce that? Um, is it just best to follow the Federal, Federal Register? get on that list is to send us an email to put you on it and I will get the email and you put it in a um, bit to cash in or it's going to be OCS registrar I believe but let me double check which email we want to use following the, the federal register is the other way to do that Previous, somebody, there's a question line uh, that the previous RFPs are available so one could start before the next one comes out. I highly advise that. I'm going to get the link to that and put that in the comment bar as well. Um, let me go ahead and um, start on my portion. And I have the fun one because I get to show pictures and projects. And it's actually been um, 
really kind of satisfying to be able to see the amount of activity that this program generated over the years. Um, I really um, applied for one of, for an OCS grant, um, which was probably about close to 30 years ago for the organization I was working with. And that's where I got started with a nonprofit. I was there for 12 years, and we had received two OCS grants during that period. Um, after leaving the nonprofit, I was uh, um, um, over at Bank of America, the Community Development Bank, and in, involved direct lending on projects as well as um, investments into loan funds. In that time, I've been at CETA doing technical assistance for many, many years now. Uh, a quick overview of CETA. Um, we uh, are, we started as an association based in California, but we've kind of grown, and we have a lot of relationships with groups throughout the country. Uh, we do a lot of work with the uh, financial regulatory agencies, uh, working with banks and helping with their meeting their CRA, Community Reinvestment Act um, programs. Um, so we've run a lot of different special programs and studies with different banks and institutions. On the federal level, we work with um, different programs, um, you know, whether it's um, HHS or HUD, different types of programs. Um, we've, we're running a program right now along the border with the North American Development Bank, working with groups throughout the states bordering um, Mexico. Um, nationally, we're, we work with a lot of different organizations. On the state level, um, we in California, we have a... Um, a track with the State Community Services Division, which allows us to provide technical assistance to community action agencies um, in California. So that's that's been um, a real help where we can actually go out and work with groups throughout um, the state, especially with community action agencies. On our website and also on the Community Action Partnership website, you can locate these um, how-to guides that were put together about four years ago. Um, and these guides are very comprehensive. I have fire trucks going by here. So, But anyhow, um, and they're very comprehensive guides. They explain step-by-step step how to do a lot of these different types of projects. It's got references. It's got resources. And it, it has a lot of um, um, tips in there. Of things that a lot of us have seen in the past that we should be wa watching out for going forward. So if you're thinking of getting into any of these subject areas, take a look at these. The importance of community economic development, um, this is something that we've been kind of preaching for a long time. Um, you know, what Community economic development type projects do, they, they leverage community strengths, as for organizational strengths. And then and Julie kind of mentioned the similarity of board structures for the CED grant program that's basically the same as most community action agencies. What we found is that we've been working with a lot of, of nonprofit groups throughout the years. And what we found is that working with community action agencies really is a leg up for us to to really move projects forward faster because the organization's boards are comprised of the right people to make projects work. And the organization has a track record of successfully operating programs. So having the right financial capacity, having technical capacity, having the right com the community connections are very important to make projects work. Um, it all builds assets for the organization, builds assets for the community. It attracts new capital to, to your communities that you're targeting. Um, creates great, great a number of employment opportunities, and you know, in the long run, builds tech, the tech capacity of the organization to do new projects going forward. Um, some of our biases when we kind of look at projects and work with them that. Um, you can get involved with a lot of putting together a lot of different types of economic development strategies, but it should really lead to projects that really implement these strategies. Uh, the project should leverage new streams of capital. And what we 
what really kind of nice working with community action agencies throughout the country is that um, the organizations have been very successful in operating service programs and the community economic development projects really kind of tap into other funds that aren't part of that system. It's, it's other dollars that are available, whether it's from HUD, Department of Energy, Energy Department of Labor, or from HHS through the OCS programs. There are different sources of money that can be used that really augments what you do. Um, we read that projects that are being developed, um, or CD projects that are being developed, should bring in a new stream of income for the organization. And the project should, at, at the very minimum, break even. We're not looking to develop projects that require funding year to year, that we really want them to kind of stand alone and be able to pay for itself going forward, if not um, generating additional income for the, for the organization. Um, we try to avoid them, but then there are a lot of programs and services that are very, very complementary. Um, a lot of the housing organizations that are out there looking for organizations that provide services to seniors, um, youth programs, Head Start programs. So in a lot of instances, a lot of community action agencies provide the necessary programs to make economic development projects work. So um, uses of OCS dollars. Um, Julie kind of went through some of the details in terms of the different types of project uses. Um, what we've seen in you know, different areas of activities include um, community facilities, commercial, industrial. Um, social enterprises have, have kind of sprung up more recently, and these are businesses that are owned by the nonprofit that kind of run as a, as a separate business itself. It could be a nonprofit business, it could be a for profit business, but it's essentially creating jobs and operating as a business generating income. Usually based after some expertise the organization has, whether it's um, um, expertise from your weatherization program and starting um, a company that gets involved with weatherization or something similar to it. And a lot of things have been happening in the, in the food industry. And you'll see that in some of the examples we have here. Here, so for the fun part, the pictures part, the um, studies. And immediately, I'll take all of you guys to Hawaii, um, which is um, interesting enough because uh, they've done quite a bit, this organization, Pacific Gateway Center. They're based in Honolulu. Kind of, I'm going to go through this in kind of a progression of what they do and kind of to explain a little bit about how they use their OCS money in the past. Um, Pacific Gateway Center, located in Honolulu, they have a farm that's about 20 miles outside of the city, about halfway to the North Shore, um, and it's the Hill Farms. And, and what they do is they actually lead um, a lot of uh, see something acres of land and they're training entrepreneurial farmers. They're actually training folks in becoming farmers. A lot of them were farmers. They work with a lot of, of refugees from Southeast Asia and they uh, teach them all about uh, farming techniques but also business assistance and they provide access to capital. And there's some examples of some of the things that they're growing. Um, you know, the top right picture shows you some of the vegetables they've grown, but then they've also kind of really got into free roaming chickens um, and then also selling the eggs. So they've been very successful. They work with 24 farmers on this um, 70 acres, but their last OCS grant, they use the money to acquire more land. And they're, they're going to be leasing an additional 110 acres. Um, sort of across the street from where they're located now. And they're also um, control 50 acres on the island. So they're looking at um, kind of expanding a lot of their farming activities to other islands in the area um, throughout Hawaii. 
and that they've been uh, very successful in is operations of their kitchen incubator. Now, this is one of the largest um, incubator, kitchen incubators throughout that we found um, in the whole country. It's about 8,000 square feet. On the first floor is um, a series of kitchens, seven different sized kitchens for entrepreneurs to use and for them to provide training. Um, on the second floor, it's all storage, dry storage, and they have a large refrigerator up there. They also have classroom space in there. Now, the building itself was was, used, was purchased or developed through an EA grant, the Economic Development Administration. Um, what OCS money has done more recently is they use part of the grant to um, solarize a building because of the enormous utility costs related to operating an incubator. It, it, the um, gas, it's especially the electricity for re uh, refrigeration and for um, air conditioning in the building. But you can see different entrepreneurs who use the facility. Um, almost got this thing to about um, um, 24 hour use. They have some guys that actually use the facility at night, so they're going to take advantage of the facility and generating more income by having um, tenants that use the building. Includes, um, these are some examples of some of the tenants. There's a market that does all their preparation work. All the different food trucks um, do their prep work and storage at their facility. And these are other businesses that are doing very well. Um, so part of the OCS funds from way back they use for entrepreneurial training. So a lot of it has gone into training these entrepreneurs and moving them into these types of businesses. In terms of when they become successful, um, use or rent space in the business incubator. A part of a more recent grant, they used to purchase this bottling machine, and that's a picture on the left there. And it's a bottling machine that's enabled um, uh, move a lot of their entrepreneurs into the value-added uh, arena. Value-added is really important. It's turning, you know, potatoes into potato chips or, um, you know, or potatoes into salsa. But it's very important because it moves. It's got such a larger um, um, margins in terms of profitability that it, that farming is really tough because the margins are so small. So. Um, creating full-time jobs is very difficult, where if the farmers or other entrepreneurs get involved with value-added type activities, they easily start generating the income to either grow their business or to hire other folks. Now, the guy at the bottom there with the dressing, he's one of the more successful businesses um, that's come out of the um, incubator. You can see that they're doing the guava juice up there. The bottom right-hand corner, is, it's an important aspect of, of um, value-added production or any type of agricultural program, its ability to distribute it. So they put together kind of a common marketing distribution um, program where they have a common label. They help their entrepreneurs get their products to market. Um, on the farm and on Cunea Farm, um, they their last OCS grant they're using to build a new um, kind of a mini kitchen incubator slash processing facility around the farm itself. So the fronts on on the main road that that's the access road to um, this region, and so on the front part of their property, they're they're they created it. Um, it's been used in the past as as where their farm's market is um, two days a week, and they've been very successful. So they've graded the land. They're going to put a slab, or they have actually already completed uh, putting a slab down and using kind of container construction. And these are the, the shipping containers that they've um, had modified. So we've got two that are different different kitchens. They've got. Uh, other ones that are separate refrigeration units. They've got others that are dry storage, and they've um, set them up 
um, throughout the front of that property, and they're including a couple that are going to have some retail sales. So they're um, kind of expanding and having kind of the on-site processing, but also it's kind of a retail outlet since it's right on the um, front road there. And they've already established a, um, somewhat of a market through their farmer's market. So um, they see this as being um, a very successful step, especially since they've got 71 acres behind them and they're going to have another um, 110 or 120 on the other side of the street in the near future. So this one with an OCS grant. The third thing that they've done is create a business incubator in Honolulu, in Chinatown, and that's a building in the upper right-hand corner. And OCS money was used for um, the acquisition and construction. Um, we were involved with it because they had a significant gap in their project. The building and, and construction originally was planned to be about a $300,000 project. I mean, three million, three point three million um, dollar project, uh, three million three hundred thousand, but ended up being closer to six and a half million, only because it's a historic building. And, and you can see in the bottom um, left of the bottom left picture, the um, ceiling joists were all replaced. The whole second floor was taken out, as well as a lot of the um, supports on the wall and. Reconstructed, reconstructed with um, um, joists and metal support beams. Um, the whole interior was brick, so they need to reinforce the whole building. Um, this one where they actually found um, an old bomb in the basement um, from World War II. It took them oh about took the Navy about four weeks to really get through there and to make sure it was safe and and. and uh, move it. So they had these really strange delays. It, plus, it's a historic building, so all those windows on the front top right there are different sizes, and they had to be specially made. So it was a very difficult project, and um, we were able to bring in um, new markets to kind of fill the gap. And that's OCS funds were used um, um, for the construction period. And essentially, it, it's part of the um, equity stack in the building. So there's other grants involved, and OCS was just one of them. And some of the businesses in the bottom of the business incubator, they've got um, um, a large restaurant that they tried um, an social enterprise, a business where Highlighted food from the chefs from the incubator. Uh, one day a week, it would, would be Thai food, uh, Chinese food, another Vietnamese, and they kind of rotated around. It, it had mixed success, but then they kind of got up into the pop up, pop up kitchen program where they allowed some of these entrepreneurs to actually run tests in their kitchens on a um, maybe it was a day or two basis once a month. So they started testing that. And some of them became very popular. And the picture along the bottom is, is food developed by um, one of their successful entrepreneurs, the pig and the lady. And they now occupy the whole floor as a restaurant and have been very successful. It's kind of the new, um, kind of the uppy place to be. And it's got a line out front all the time. So they're doing very, very uh, well in, in Chinatown. So, um, I, I have a lot of details regarding this group only because they've used their money in a lot of different ways um, to really kind of get involved with the process from start to finish. So you talk about food to fork, from food table or food to fork, you're talking about farming all the way through distribution, through entrepreneurial development, through training programs, and really getting food out the door. Um, Program. One of the things we also ran across and they will be getting involved in is they're looking forward to really looking at um, aquaponics. Um, and it should it says hydroponic farm, but that's actually an aquaponic one. So anyhow, the top two pictures 
is a is a group that's right next to their farm who has one of the largest aquaponic farms um, in well definitely in Hawaii, and they believe it's it's in, in most of the West Coast, and that's different types of lettuce that's being grown. The tanks on the upper left there are filled with tilapia, and water runs in kind of a closed system used to provide water and nutrition for the uh, the plants there, and the water is returned into the tanks there for to where the tilapia are, and they just use the tilapia for uh, providing um, the fertilizer essentially for the plant. Um, the board pictures there is a um, homeless shelter in um, Honolulu. It's a four-story building and the rooftop um, aquaponic farm. So they've got these smaller tanks on the rooftop um, with the water kind of feeding through growing um, organizables that is being used in the homeless shelter. They've got a kitchen in there and they these, they, these guys actually farm the uh, tapia that's being grown as part of the food for the um, homeless shelter. Program, a group working with, uh, or we talked to recently in Anacostia in Washington, D.C., is um, kind of taking a strategy of, of doing smaller standalone aquaponic farms and they're working with the school district and trying to set them up in the elementary schools in their community so that they can teach kids about um, organic foods and farming and, and aquaponics in general and have the neighborhood involved as a source of food also. So um, it, it's going to be an interesting project. They're kind of using that technology for kind of new education and training, and that's in Anacostia. And this grant. Um, in terms of of some enterprises, now this is the big dog um, Recycle Force in Indianapolis, Indiana. They recycle, call Recycle Force because they do two things: they recycle folks that are coming out of the criminal justice system, and they're recycling electronics. So it's 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 recycling both that they're really focused on. Um, started out with about. Um, um, Five, six people and with hammers that used to smash up computers and take the parts out of it. And they've kind of grown, and this is basically growth through the OCS program. They had a series of grants that allowed them to buy equipment to do the training and to extend their facilities. And right now they've got about 140 employees, um, all of the criminal justice system. They receive Department of Justice dollars that do a lot of the um, services and training and education pieces for the for their employees, but they do work here um, on a consistent basis, learning work skills. Um, I think there was something like in in a lot of the low income neighborhoods in Indianapolis, one of seven people are um, tied into the criminal justice system. Either they're on parole, or they're under watch, or they're under some different phase of of the judicial system um, there in Indianapolis. So, real important um, um, in terms of community development to be able to train folks and get them jobs. So, the their funds were used in part for purchases of this machine. Now, this machine took them to from from mashing things with hammers to actually loading it into the machine and it, and it really kind of grinds it all up and brings it into the separate pieces. And, and that's what's happening on the left side of the picture. They're kind of shifting through, taking out some, some of the materials. But most of it ends up circuit boards there that are kind of crunched up. They just put the funding to purchase a new machine, and this is through an OCS grant also. And the new machine actually breaks it up into finer pieces and separates it better. The better they separate gold and some of the valuable um, items out of the uh, waste stream, the better price they can get for the sales of it. So they're a very successful company. 140 people that are working um, and doing very well. So that's a social enterprise that I guess an enterprise on steroids doing very well. 
uh, community development. We're putting together a series of incubators. Um, this is the top left picture is taken from um, their their and new um, uh, senior project, the four story senior citizen project. And right across the street is going to be their incubator, and it's under construction right now, or under rehab. The money coming from OCS. It's really focused on business development, um, entrepreneurial training, and that's going to focus of, of this project. Right across the street from them um, is, their, is where they're going to locate their kitchen incubator. Now, it, the incubator is going to be along that empty land there that you see in front of you in the top left picture. Those buildings along the back is the old commercial strip of uh, Nogales. And a closer picture of it is, is a picture on the right. It had real kind of 50s retro look. But it, is, it used to be a thriving business center, but it's been kind of a um, ape over the years now since um, most of the folks um, um, are living and shopping on the, on the Juarez side of the border. If you look at the picture on the top left there, on that little mound towards the middle right of the picture there, you can see that big fence there, and that's the bird right there. It draws on to the buildings there um, on the right side of that picture, and the lower hand the picture there, the border is actually right behind um, the buildings on the left, it, it butts up against it. So, um, Gallus is right on the border, and their kitchen incubator is being developed right downtown. It's, they're going to use containers also as their building structure. A little bit different, they're going to kind of connect a lot of them to put together their kitchen portion, and then some retail and other types of uses. Um, they plan to do slowly add to it as you see the needs for specialized equipment for value-added production, they're going to just kind of add the containers to the, to the project itself. So it's going to be a very interesting project. They've got a great location since they are downtown, but the no CS money for the incubator, uh, for the business incubator, and for the kitchen incubator. Money is being set aside to um, a little bit for a loan program, but also for um, entrepreneurial training. So it's covering services as well as um, construction and development. Westside Community Development in Milwaukee. You guys have used their money in a lot of different ways. Um, it's a loan fund, but they're more focused on equity type investments. What they've been doing over the years is getting OCS grants and attracting major companies into their neighborhood. Um, picture is, um, I think, their 15 or 14 grant, which they used to um, um, bring this large manufacturer um, and very successful in creating jobs in their community. Um, they sure their equity investment so that it gets paid back. So their whole goal is to bring in companies to revolve their equity investment. And over the years, as they get new ones year to year, the returns on their older one creating larger pool, which they can in turn attract larger businesses into um, their targeted community. Here are the things that they've been involved in. And, um, initially, with different grants, they brought in grocery stores. Um, they've done a lot of uh, um, technology-related um, companies brought them in and developed an incubator around it. But, um, you know, they're slowly um, revolving that money and doing larger and larger projects. Right now they're working on a mixed-use project. Um, and their whole focus is on this 30-acre project that they're um, involved in and trying to put together going forward. So they've been able to, to really kind of um, expand the use of the OCS grants and build a larger pool and use the funds very similarly where they'll invest it to bring in companies that that hires a lot of folks. So uh, it's really kind of changing the face of the neighborhood there. 
Now, this group, the Latino um, Development Center in Minneapolis, is a little bit different. They're doing the same thing, but they're using their equity dollars to create new nonprofit organizations. And their hope for goal is that the nonprofit organizations will do well enough and establish themselves, and maybe they'll get paid back in the future, but that's not a primary goal. So the offices are located in the building on the bottom left area they share with other nonprofits. They use the money and brought in a supermarket around the corner from that market. Um, surrounding the building, and this is kind of behind it to the left of that building um, on the left-hand um, picture, they have a distribution center. And you have a big, giant bay door there and, and parking space. Um, this, this building pool and they have two buses that take fresh vegetables um, and fresh items to uh, food desert neighborhoods in the um, in the region there. So the buses pull in, they fill it up with all with food, they've been all reconfigured to have refrigeration and they take the fresh foods out to the community. So two buses um, um, are paid for through or at least partially supported by OCS funds. The uh, distribution facility behind them has a giant refrigerator, and they work the separate nonprofit that the distribution. In. And what they do is aggregate uh, food from a lot of different co-ops, and they create um, a place where they can hit the um, contract needs of major uh, food food stores, markets, and restaurants. So they're able to aggregate enough tomatoes to serve uh, something like a Whole Foods or someone like that, um, and, and able to secure contracts based on that. So they provide that distribution service type business. So there's another one that they've they've um, entered. This nonprofit that they started up is Kitchen Incubator, and this was through OCS dollars also. And the Kitchen Incubator is going to work with different entrepreneurs. Um, that are part of the food uh, distribution uh, facility and will be able to use this facility to do value-added production as well as just um, um, kind of the food markets or food, food um, truck type activity. So another business that they've invested in. So this is a commercial facility. They use the money to acquire the property. Um, they're totally rehabbing it. And this is in Ajo, Arizona, which is about 20 miles north of the border, the Mexican border in Arizona, in the middle of nowhere, essentially. The community has about um, 1,000 people on a good day, meaning um, in the wintertime when a lot of the folks from Canada come down um, for warmer weather, they end up in this area. It used to be a mining town. The depot on the left side there, the building, will train that it used to carry copper um, up north toward to Phoenix. So a um, center that's been in disrepair, they purchased it, they've been rehabbing it and working with small entrepreneurs and starting new businesses. There's a population of border-related security folks around. So it works out real well that they provide kind of the um, shopping and other um, community needs for the city of Ajo. Um, this is a, a, um, a project that they've, they've initiated, and this is a conference center. And this is primarily money that came from the Ford Foundation. And it was an old um, elementary school, and they're just rehabbing a lot of these rooms here that you see in their classroom. They're split into and creating kind of um, um, health space for the conferences. And they have conference uh, rooms along the back there and a large commercial kitchen that they, that they built. This is a quick one. Um, um Economic Development and Workforce Alliance, um, they use their funds, their OCS dollars, as an equity investment to entice a business to locate a food desert. Now, Turlock is a is in the Central Valley. It's a food desert, 
what they did was provide um, very cheap equity financing to bring this group into their community. Um, being the workforce alliances, they have also used um, a lot of the WIB, the Department of Labor monies to kind of provide a lot of the training also for their employees. So it, it, it's a real interesting, kind of a neat um, um, way to bring in um, the facility or the business that's really needed in a community while creating jobs. Uh, community Services Unlimited, this is a nonprofit who's actually a spin-off from the old Black Panthers. And they're really into food, local food production. And um, they have a farm. They also buy from other uh, co ops and other farms. They use the, they take the foods through different channels, through retail. Um, they have their own little farm stands um, that they've started. They work with other um, nonprofits that have farm stands. And they also have a um, Kind of corner market program where they provide fresh foods for some of the smaller stores and markets on an ongoing basis to get make sure there's fresh food in their community. For example, when their farm stands, they run um, CSA programs, the community supported agricultural programs, which you they provide ag foods on a weekly basis and sell it to a subscription basis. Um, so, kind of some other examples that I just wanted to touch on since we're kind of we're running out of time here. Um, Anacostia, I talked a little bit about it having the aquaponics farm in neighborhood schools. Justin Peterson, they use their money to expand their CDFI, their Community Development Financial Institution Loan Fund. Asian Consortium Employment, a group in Los Angeles, they use they've got. Received several grants over the years. One started a green technology business incubator. Another to start a social enterprise, a healthcare business, and they used it to capitalize a construction and management company, uh, which is a subsidiary company to the organization. Yeta del Norte in New Mexico, are, they're putting together a food hub at this time. In a previous grant, they um, worked on putting a distribution facility together. Park Environmental Progress in San Diego, they're focused in investing in the environmentally focused for-profit businesses. So they're, they're kind of equity investors in projects. UMQA up in Roseburg, um, they did an expansion of their deconstruction business where they tear down old homes, take the, the reasonable parts out, and they sell it on kind of a um, um, wholesale retail level. Um, Thai CC, they're in the process of developing a public market. Um, kind of interesting one, the Aleutian Pribble Off Island Community Development Association. They're using their funds um, to develop a fuel tank farm for the Bering Pacific Seafood Processing Company. And this will allow the company to employ more people because of the um, limited number of fuel storage um, that they have on the islands there. And if anyone watched um, World's Deadliest Catch, the seafood company is the one that processes their catch up in the Aleutian Islands. So it's kind of an interesting place to, to, to have a project. But you can see the variations of projects involved, um, you know, whether you use it as a to capitalize your loan fund or your equity fund um, to build larger funds and revolve it, you know, that's one strategy. But actually developing real estate projects or developing a business or investing in a business, you know, are other ways this dollar, the, the OCS dollars can be used. And that's why it's such a great program because it's got that flexibility to do things that you normally can't with other types of program dollars. Um, one of the caveats is that, you know, what we found um, groups there who have successful projects are ones that can rely on something that they know well, whether it's um, agricultural 
um, agriculturally based or, or it's in food reduction or it's in, you know, through Head Start kitchens having that opportunity. That is something that you know already, that you know the industry well enough and you're able to create something that has that support of the community. So it, it, it's, it's really important to, to do what you know and kind of work off of that. Um, and if you don't, and you still, and it's still an important community need. Um, bring in that resource, you know. Partner with somebody. Bring in a company that knows what they're doing, and, and you know that way you've got to their um, program requirement, which is that ongoing success that you're going to create jobs that are going to be there for um, a longer period. And I think that should do it. And if there are questions or comments, um, Julie's still on, and hopefully we'll be able to answer them. Thank you. And as a, one last reminder, you can put those questions in through the chat window or the Q&A box, both of those on that right-hand um, kind of user panel over there. Uh, and with that, while we give you a, a few seconds to get any last-minute questions in, do want to remind you that uh, you can always send questions after the fact. Uh, Glenn has his information uh, right up on the screen, or you can reach out to us at the partnership, uh, Kevin, uh, here at the partnership, um, and we will um, answer or at least find you someone who can. So, with, are there uh, any closing words from um, any of our people today? Kevin, anybody with any uh, closing thoughts while we uh, see if there's any questions that come in? Well, I think um, uh, people, sh you know, people should explore this program, and uh, you know, do Julie mentioned the website at at OCS to look at that because there's a lot of variations of projects out there that are being developed, and um, um, all of us that that Cashin mentioned, uh, we can connect you to them, or we can find people who know something about it, and it's a resource that um, you take advantage of while it's out there. This is Julie. My closing thought is: don't be scared. Um, when we first started the project at the partnership, here and go. Um, agencies are doing this, you may not call it community economic development, but you're meeting a community need that has a community economic development component. Um, Glenn's described some amazing projects that are fairly large. Um, we also have projects that are much, much, sm excuse me, much smaller um, that may be uh, restoring residential building for income folks to reside and running a program in it. It may be uh, starting a food truck. I mean, I think there's a variety of things, and I would encourage you to look at this program and to really think about economic development, not just because of your communities, but n none of us talked about today is what it can actually do for your agency, which is that it can generate unrestricted dollars to do other things. Um, so I really encourage you to uh, think about a social enterprise or economic development and help, help, help those you serve, but also opportunities for your agency. Conference, we're going to have some more sessions that are roughly the same area or kind of uh, different offshoots of other types of community economic development activities. And, uh, yeah, feel free to contact us. All right, then. So like the uh, questions are slowing down um, a little bit here, so we can uh, go ahead and start wrapping up. Um, uh, nobody complains about getting out five minutes early from class there, so I uh, do hope that you will be able to join us on the uh, last webinar in this series on uh, July the 27th, um, as well as joining us at the annual convention where we do have uh, six pretty good uh, community economic development focused sessions, uh, several of them actually coming uh, from Cecita, um, from Ralph and Glenn there. 
So with that, uh, we will be putting these slides and the record up in the next couple of days for you guys. So those will serve as a resource. And have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Uh, 18 years old.